You're quiet, this is about 30, 45 seconds early, but we'll go ahead and start. Um, welcome to the Genetic Engineering Society Colloquium. Thanks for being here. I'm Jason Delborn. I'm one of the cluster faculty in GES and also uh, an associate professor at Forestry and Environmental Resources. Um, we always like to start for the first couple of minutes and just with announcements of GES related events over the next week. Anybody have anything they want to announce? It's early in this month. No pressure. But, you know, if it's happening, we want to know about it. Um, if, if not, then I'll just announce that um, our speaker next week is David Resnick. Um, and he's going to be speaking about community engagement in field trials of genetically modified mosquitoes. Um, and uh, I will not be here, so I'm really sad to miss this one, but I will not be here. Um, so I'll find someone to introduce. You can introduce him. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you so Unless much. Unless somebody else knows him better. Okay. Anybody else know him better? Okay. <coughs> and let's call. Excellent. No, no more other events to announce? Okay, well this week um, we are very happy to have Paul Vincelli here. Um, he is uh, from the University of Kentucky. Um, his position is Extension Professor and Provost Distinguished Service Professor, um, which I think will uh, get a sense of what that means when he talks about his work. Um, he is in the Department of Plant Pathology. Uh, he joined that faculty in 1990. He works on management of diseases of turf grasses and forest trees, molecular diagnostics, <coughs> uh, sustainability of food systems, um, and he's also served as Kentucky's co-coordinator co for the USDA's Southern Regional Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Um, so he's done work domestically and internationally. Um, we're really excited to have him here visiting with us. I know a number of you have met with him already, and there will be more meetings to come. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I will set up the presentation clock that Paul has been warned about. But I, there's not actual lightning that comes out of the ceiling um, at 30 minutes. But we'll have time for Paul to give us about 30 minutes of a lecture, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So please keep track of things that you'd like to ask. Anyway. Can we get the lights up a little bit? Thank you, Jason. And uh, I'm going to stand back here because there is a microphone, and I think it'll help me protect my voice and also be heard by those online. Um, and I'm going to respect that 30-minute uh, guideline. Um, Fred and Jennifer, thank you, and, and Jason, for the invitation to come speak. I'm really excited to be here. And um, so I'll just get move on into the next slide. So I, I think it's important to uh, give uh, to this group, and really most groups, a list of all the uh, private sector funding I've received for work in genetic engineering. And that's the list. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just so happens that I have not ever received, a, that I can recall any material benefit to uh, doing any work on, outreach work on genetic engineering, and I've never actually engineered a plant. So, so there are people in this room that know more about genetic engineering than I do, and I welcome your comments. Um, I think I'm spot on on the core science, but, uh, uh, but the, the important thing is that there's, a, you know, I, and there's nothing wrong with hey, receiving funding, right? Having a conflict of interest in genetic engineering. It's, it has to be disclosed, I think, if you're doing outreach, but um, it, it just so happens I've not received any funding in this area. So why do I have a passion for talking about this topic? Well, I think that used wisely, the, um, the, these technologies can contribute to the common good particularly in areas of increased food security and uh, improved sustainability of our, our uh, food production systems and food systems. So that's my, my I think, my motivation. Um, so plant transformation has been the workhorse of engineering plants for several decades now. And for those who are not familiar with it, we, there are two common ways that plants are transformed. And one is to actually use, you see on the left, a natural en genetic engineer called Agrobacterium tumefaciens to insert into the plant genes that get incorporated into the plant's genome. So that's one way that people have done genetic engineering. And the other is through particle bombardment, where you actually physically shoot the DNA, which is coated onto uh, micro pellets, into the plant cells, and then some of those take up the DNA and it gets incorporated into the genome. So um, these techniques are useful. Um, but they do introduce uh, genes and gene fragments in random locations in the genome. So that's one of the disadvantages of these technologies. CRISPR is, uh, CRISPR-based techniques of gene editing are sort of a new wave of technologies 
um, that, that don't have this uh, difficulty of in random insertion. And um, basically, the concept of CRISPR gene editing derives from where we're taking advantage of a natural uh, defense mechanism of certain bacteria and certain archaea that to, uh, to uh, fight back against uh, invading DNA, particularly that of, of uh, phages. And so on the left, so what the components of the CRISPR-Cas9 system are represented here on the upper left. And you can see that the orange sort of balloony structure is the Cas9 enzyme that cuts the double-stranded DNA of your target or its target, whatever it is. And then um, the, 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 uh, that enzyme is guided by the, the little um, item that's, well, I can probably point to this. That, and right there, that is the uh, the guide RNA, which matches the particular target that it is, you know, that, that it, it's designed to match. And so then we get this double-stranded cleavage, and that's the limit of what CRISPR-Cas9, this this uh, the molecular machine, does. Is it makes this double-stranded cut in a specific location. And so on the left, what happens is once the cut is made, then the cell, you know, needs to repair that DNA, and so it repairs by, uh, by that uh, one possibility on the left-hand side of non-homogous end joining. Oh, OK. Thank you. And, um, and so this happens in the plant in, in uh, eukaryotic cells. And so the repair occurs, but, uh, but actually often will include insertions or deletions of a very small number of nucleotides. On the right, donor repair or, or DNA repair occurs if we occur in this fashion, if we include a, um, a repair template which has homology to both arms uh, straddling the cut, but also includes that light blue segment which is introduced DNA. Okay, and so that now you can actually introduce a gene. So, so imagine that the repair occurs this way by, by being directed by this template. Um, we've inserted a new gene. So if that's a gene for resistance to disease, then that's, we've accomplished that. And it's been inserted in a specific area in the genome. But what about this kind of repair? That's obviously going to increase disease resistance. But what about this kind of uh, random insertion of, of one or more nucleotides or deletions at the cut site? Well, this is what they actually would look like. These are actual sequences of a particular target gene that have been gene edited, and you see them. The deletions, which really mimic what would happen in nature, these are these are impossible to distinguish from natural mutations. But what's important is that is that the uh, the the, uh, the indel has been made in a particular target gene, and so this target resistance can lead to powdery mildew, which is treated with fungicide in, in for uh, against against which farmers in Kentucky treat with with fungicide. So that's a really good example of something in the lab that show some promise for pesticide reduction. All right, so that's how the basic system works and maybe on a basic level how it relates to uh, plant disease control. But, but how do they actually accomplish these double-stream cuts and repairs that, that make a difference in, in the genetics of the plant? Well, there are a number of ways that this can be done. I'm going to keep it short by just focusing on one that caught my attention. And there, that purple balloony thing is the Cas9 enzyme. It's colored purple in this, in this graphic. And um, there is the, the uh, guide RNA, which is going to guide it to a particular gene target to make its cut. And this, this little ribonuclear protein can be transfected into plant, into plant protoplasts, or using standard techniques, or uh, shot in, again, once again, with the gene gun, um, which sounds violent, but it actually does work. And um, so you can get this. And you know, notice this is RNA and an enzyme. So there's actually, this is the DNA-free plant editing. So it's kind of, I think, just an interesting case where they didn't insert any novel DNA at any step in the, in the process. OK. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, or gene editing is, is generally recognized as, as a precise way to make uh, genetic changes in plants. Um, targeted, targeted and very limited changes of pretty much those that you design. We can go more into depth in this in the question and answer into some of the nuance, including some of the recent research that's been just uh, released in a, in a, uh, in a in BioRx, I guess it's called. 
Um, but anyway, that's 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 generally perceived. It's generally perceived to be precise. Way to make uh, genome changes. Uh, flexibility in, type, in terms of the types of changes you can make. I just touched on several. Um, it's uh, generally considered to be a predictable way to make genetic changes. And finally, it's co often considered to democratize genetic engineering because of its relative, and uh, I'm repeating what researchers say about it. Generally, it's low cost and, um, and uh, relative ease of use. So if, if that isn't fitting your own experience, I'd be glad to hear about it. But that's what's often um, described in the literature. So with respect to plant disease control through host plant resistance, I, I, I'm going to come back to this point, but gene editing can provide all the transgenic and all the cisgenic applications that have been done but with the older techniques of genetic engineering. All those techniques could, could be done with genome editing or CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And it can, this, these technologies can also provide for targeted mutations. You saw an example of that where we made specific indels or something that, uh, in a particular gene of interest. We can um, create large deletions and we can also create a wheel of sub substitution. So there's really a lot of things that can be done with CRISPR-Cas9 that impact disease resistance in plants. So that's a quick overview. Um, I want to talk about now moving to the subject of, of uh, pesticides. And so here, these are uh, data that are a little more than a decade old, but I think they're still useful. Um, herbicides. We all, those of us who work in agriculture, recognize that herbicides are sort of the big area of pesticide use. And so the question arises, could CRISPR-Cas9 be useful in reducing herbicide use? I'm not a weed scientist, but I, I do have, feel like I've, I've got a pretty good handle on some things to, to suggest. And one question that comes up is, Chris, can CRISPR-Cas9 help us in creating herbicide-tolerant crops? And it, it's being used that way by uh, major manufacturers, seed companies, and, and, uh, and other companies. Um, so let's, let me comment on that. So Roundup Ready crops are probably the most commonly used example of genetic engineering in the world. And, um, and it's, it's, I'm going to just say very simply two things about it. One, this technology is useful. You just have to talk to a farmer who uses it to understand that it's useful. And it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Useful, but not sustainable. And so the not sustainable derives from the fact that it's it, 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 there's really been a lot of challenges to the development of herb, herbicide-resistant weeds. And um, you know, I've never had a grower, grower question that statement. It is useful, and it's not sustainable. So I don't think CRISPR is going to immediately help us in this area through engineering herbicide tolerant crops in terms of reducing pesticide use. What about genes for allelopathy, which is the ability to, uh, to, for a plant to poison a neighboring plant through root exudates? Um, there is research being done on that. It's quite premature to think it'll be applied in the commercial agriculture, but you know, maybe someday down the road. What about thinness suppressing gene drives, where we engineer the weed to actually um, spread a gene amongst itself, that, among this population, that diminishes its fitness? Again, research is being done in that area. We're way, way away from, you know, far away from having um, this be a commercial practice. So, so I don't think we've got an answer through CRISPR to reducing herbicide use yet, at least none that I know about. Insecticide, miticide, fungicide, bactericide use, I think it's low hanging fruit, as somebody who's looked rather deeply at this. So first of all, let me start with this slide. This is from my PhD work on the tritus leaf light of onion. That very coasty area that looks like it was treated with a propane flamethrower is all natural inoculum. There was nothing done to that special except they shut off the sprayer. So um, if you don't work with plant disease in the field, you do, you, I want you to appreciate that plant, host plant susceptibility drives epidemics. It is a major driving factor. And that's why they use fungicides on them. Oops, sorry. This is another point that's really fundamental to apply plant pathologists. Disease resistance can displace the need for pesticide. So if you are managing this turf grass, that's a root disease, by the way. So you're going 
you're going to spray a lot of chemical if you're going to do it by chemical approaches. Whereas this one, no need, at least against this disease. So, you know, again, the picture tells, tells the story and the experience of applied plant pathologists throughout the world. If we have crops that are resistant to prevailing diseases, we, we, uh, they don't, there is much reduced need for fungicide. We see this in reality. This isn't just a concept, but we see this is the, the use of insecticides in corn since 1998, the introduction of Bt resistant plants engineered for resistance to European corn borer and certain other um, insects. So growers recognize that there's a, there are opportunities to reduce pesticide use if they have reliable disease resistance. This is not commercialized yet, and, and um, it's one from the University of Florida, and I think it, you know, it's a really good example, again, of, of something that relates to plant disease control. This disease, bacterial spot of, of pepper and, tom and tomatoes, is, is very damaging. North Carolina has some wonderful epidemics of it, so, uh, and I say that as a plant, I just not, not as a grower. Um, so, uh, so here is an engineered plant with a uh, single gene of busier tomatoes with a single gene uh, for recognizing the presence of the pathogen uh, placed into tomato. So it's really still the same defense mechanisms that tomato would normally have, but it's triggered by being able to recognize the presence of the pathogen. And right now what they're doing is, uh, growers are doing, is using a lot of copper spray. That is not sustainable, that is not good for the environment, it's not good for people the workers. Um, so I think that the gene, genetic approach in this case would actually be pretty beneficial. And so we know again that, um, that genetic engineering traits with wisely used can reduce the use of pesticides. And this is an example from uh, Bt Brinjal or, or eggplant uh, in Bangladesh. And it's uh, been adopted widely by farmers. And they've dramatically reduced their use of insecticides. So there are challenges, there are issues and concerns, but I wanted to really make this point strongly <coughs> that resistance, genetic resistance by any means, provides opportunity to reduce pesticide use. So I wrote a paper in the Journal of Sustainability that was published a couple years ago, and, and uh, what I did was I uh, in, did several things, I touched on several things, including concerns, um, but I also outlined the different strategies that have been used through genetic engineering for uh, disease resistance. And, and in fact, after publication, there were two, I say et cetera, because there were two um, strategies that were that are novel that are not described in my paper um, that, that came out since publication. So this is a dynamic field, and there are more and more opportunities for ways, strategies, to engineer plant disease resistance. So it's, it's well established that, first of all, genetics solutions Notice I'm saying genetic solutions, not genetic engineering, because conventional breeding as well fits here, and that is genetic solutions can displace pesticides for control of diseases and insects. And we know, too, that genetic engineering can produce disease-resistant plants. It does not mean that always the best solution is genetic engineering. A lot of times it isn't the best solution, but it is an option. And sometimes the breeder will be the one to say, that's a better, that's a better solution than, than uh, the conventional approach. Let's go that way. OK, so, um, so I, hopefully I've established the, the potential value of genetic engineering towards reducing fungicide use. Um, but, but one of the important questions is, how do we use these, technology, these genetic traits sustainably? And I'll give you my thoughts in the open, open years. So I think it comes down to the word diversity, okay? So first of all, we, we can deploy these and should deploy these using a diversity of control practice, practices. So what I mean by that is don't just rely on the one gene that confers resistance to your favorite disease, but um, you know, use multiple control measures, including crop rotation and all the other things that you need to do. Um, you know, ideally, at least the more of these are implemented, the, the slower the, the lower the pressure towards overcoming those uh, those genetic traits, and we have, we have a name for this. It's called integrated pest management, and it's as relevant today in the world of BT crops as it is ever has been. Okay. 
Um, so I feel like I've you know, made that point, but this one maybe needs a little bit more explanation. I think diversity in gene deployment is also an understood concept that applies very much here in this case. So let me explain what I mean. So diversity in gene deployment can occur via different approaches. And first of all, it means maybe using diverse mechanisms. So um, multiple way, multiple genetic mechanisms to target the pathogen instead of just one. And there's lim limits to how easily this can be done, particularly when you start getting to regulatory costs. But I'm, I'm here to present the concept, at least, in a prompt discussion about this. So, Diverse mechanisms can be deployed. Multiple targets can be um, targeted. So here we have a particular gene where this, grow, this uh, researcher group, research group uh, targeted, they, uh, they made uh, RNAi constructs that targeted three different um, targets on the gene of interest instead of one. So we're, we're giving the pathogen, uh, making it harder for the, I mean the military uh, uh, analogy is probably best where multiple you know, attacks on different fronts instead of just a single attack. Gene pyramiding, which you can see represented on the right, and uh, some multiple genes um, merged together in a single genetic construct. And th th this is not a concept that applies just to genetic engineering. This concept of pyramiding goes back to conventional breeding. It's just maybe easier in many cases to accomplish it with genetic engineering. Rotation of genes, so, so uh, again, why, in the case of, say, an annual crop, why not um, build into the program if, if, um, if, if there are no social concerns, and that's, that's an issue I will return to, but if, if there are no social concerns, why not rotate different genes in, you know, in the breeding program? So you use gene X for five years, and then five, you know, and you use gene Y for five years, and you use gene Z for five years, and so on. Always made it difficult for the pathogen to go. And I, I want to just add that the high throughput gene discovery cloning uh, methods that, are, that have been published recently really, really help us in taking advantage of this genetic knowledge. So all of these are facilitated through genetic engineering. All of these can be facilitated through genetic engineering. It's not that it's the best way, but it, it, is, it is going to be a faster way sometimes to get there. So my, my opinion is gene editing, in particular gene editing, as compared to other ways of doing genetic engineering, will likely permit more rapid breeding responses to evolving path, plant pathogens. And so I actually think that the sustainable use of genetic resources for disease control is not, it, it, it depends not on not using genetic <coughs> solutions, but in using them with greater uh, wisdom and with more, uh, you know, more innovation, more reliance on genetic knowledge, not less. All right, so um, I'm not going to really do justice to this topic. I didn't want to acknowledge that social considerations are part of the picture. So I'm a biologist. I focus on that part, but uh, not exclusively focused on that part. I trust, me, trust, uh, trust me on that. In fact. I had the privilege of interviewing both Fred Gould for talking biotech and, and Jennifer Kuzma for talking biotech. So, so it's, uh, it's a great, great experience to have them contribute to my own understanding. So some of the questions that this group is probably very familiar with, but I, I want to put up there <coughs> nevertheless, and that is, who decides how to use this technology? Right? Who decides? I don't have the answers. But, it, but these are good for us natural scientists to think about. Who benefits from the technology? Who is disadvantaged? And does genetic engineering promote food access? Sometimes maybe yes, maybe, maybe not in others, I don't know. But I do, I do want to address some aspects of that. This is a grower, a smallholder, farmer in Nicaragua, and um, there's got his saved corn. And um, you know, sometimes there's concern about what happens to smallholders with licensed technologies. So I want to give, uh, recognize that as, as a concern. And I also want to point out that there are projects that I'm aware of that really excite me because 
the, the, for example, the Verka project is a, is a project out of the Danforth Institute and with uh, uh, African uh, collaborators, it's not all uh, the Danforth scientists. And, um, and they actually engineered resistance to uh, Brown Street mosaic virus in cassava. And um, my understanding is, it's clearly stated in their publications, that, that, that this, this technology must be given away freely. So not all genetic engineering results necessarily in uh, applications that are expand the thinking. That's what I'm trying to do here. And that is, you know, sometimes um, the, the uh, genetic engineered trait might have benefit to smallholders. And I, I mentioned one moment ago on cassava, and this is, this is at least the early data with uh, BT cotton in India. And the number of pesticide poisonings was uh, higher in the non-BT farmers than the BT farmers. And it kind of makes sense. If you are using a crop that doesn't need as much insecticide, then you're going to be exposed to less insecticide. And that's, been, that's been the finding in both India and China. And, and this one I found interesting. That Colombian women who grew BT cotton actually appreciated it, liked it, because uh, it gave them extra time, free time, and reduced costs. They didn't have to necessarily hire somebody to, uh, to apply the insecticide. All right, so now I'm back in my role as a plant, an applied plant pathologist. So I took that picture, did not get oversprayed. <laughs> Moved fast, had it all, had a plant. All right, so anyway, if we want to, this is me talking, but I, I really believe this from 35 years of, of working with fungicides. This guy's got no protection. And again, if we want him to have alternative, if we want him to reduce using insecticides, pesticides, he needs alternatives. And this is the most poignant picture that little girl is about 10 meters away from that rice field. This again is in Central America. And she gets exposed to that when they spray by air. Um, so, and I took that picture, so I know about this situation. And, um, you know, once again, I'd like to see the rice grower have alternatives that allow him to believe that he doesn't have to spray. I've worked with pesticides for disease control for 35 years. And I don't think I've done very much to reduce pesticide use. Um, I've tried, actually, but it's hard. And, and I think that plant pathologists, with, maybe with rare exception, just the legal oil wiggle room, I think the plant pathologists generally understood, generally understand host plant resistance as the principal pathway, if not a principal pathway, to reducing pesticide use. We need to get farmers to waste to allow them to back off, knowing that the crop will be okay. I believe CRISPR-based genome editing opens doors to engineering disease resistance. And sometimes it does so with advantages compared to transformation and conventional breeding. They're all going to be important, especially conventional breeding. Especially conventional breeding. That's still the baseline of, of, of crop improvement. But um, I think CRISPR prevents, presents some opportunities. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here to speak in the Genetic Engineering Society Center. And I actually brought it in in under, <laughs> under uh, 30 minutes, so I'm really <laughs> To field your own question. Sure. OK. Yes, sir. So Paul, I enjoyed your, uh, your, your talk on how to keep uh, genetically engineered or any, any genetically um, disease-resistant and insecticide resistance more sustainable. Mm -hmm. But when I listen to that, I think you could take those same concepts and say we could make herbicide products more sustainable also. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't dispute that. So for example? Well, for example, you talk about or using something for so many years and using something else for so many years and rotating yeah. and other, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know how you would accomplish it. Right. Yeah, well, Modes I... of action, things like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think the same principles are involved. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point. Um, so diversity in, in ways to control weeds. Mm -hmm. I think I think we can we can... 
expect that that would slow the development of herbicide resistance as well, totally. And so, so really, yeah, you can, once we can go back to the point about how I, there, there's an IPM helps protect the, the, the gene for resistance in plants or helps protect the gene for resistance, yeah, in, against herbicides by, by ro using different tactics. In fact, I hear weed scientists talking about that, using culture practices to reduce weed pressure and then using um, different herbicides in, you know, one in one year, one in another, or, or mixing, you know, this, yeah, all these concepts could, could certainly apply. I, I, I totally agree. I, I know we get into difficulties like, well, how do you actually get farmers to do that, right? Do they need incentives? Because maybe the two herbicides that I want to rotate are, you know, one's cheaper than another, or one's got a more, broader spectrum than another, so now I'm going to want this one, right? Um, but uh, to me, the, the, the practical questions of how do we get there are, are equally important, but they, they, are, they come first when we have a conceptual and data basis for knowing that it's worth doing these things. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask, um, at least in the US, how um, the gene editing process actually works as far as like laws. Like, if you were to edit the genes of a crop, would you have to do an environmental impact study before you actually put it into practice? You, if you took away like an insect food source, wouldn't that affect the rest of the environment? Right. Okay. So really, two questions. One is, one is, if you took away an insect, does it affect the food sources and the ecology, basically, of the ecosystem, both within the agro ecosystem and beyond? Very good question. Um, yeah. The the. Um, so there's some entomologists in the room that maybe can add to this. Um, my understanding of the literature is that um, the introduction of what's used in the case of the BT trait has generally had an impact, ecological impact, largely on um, plant feeding insects and and insects that might parasitize them. So, so yes, we're, we're, we're you know we can infect the, the ecology, but mostly in ways that are des desirable to reduce the insect pest. You also asked about uh, what kind of laws or regulations would be relevant to CRISPR or maybe other genetic engineering, if I can expand your question, right? Um, yeah, it's another good question. And, and I, I understand regulatory aspects to a degree, um, but I, I have found them actually to be more complex than the biochemistry. <laughs> so, so, but I do know you're interested in this. You, 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 will, you will be interested to know that um, the USDA APHIS Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, the regulatory agency, one of the regulatory agencies for genetically engineered crops, is um, discussing in a public forum um, possible changes to the regulatory system. And so I could, I could talk a little bit about those, but um, I'll, I'll loop, maybe I'll loop back for that, to that if, if, yeah, if we're taking a few questions. Can I just jump in? Yeah. I, right now, I think most are going to be exempt from the regulatory process mm -hmm. if they're not, if they don't contain plant pest sequences. So, um, and, and it seems like USDA is going to stick with that, although you're right, they're starting a new round of conversations about it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the specifics. I'm going to do this from memory, but I think I've got. I think I've got it. Um, they will exempt uh, from regulation um, four classes, I, and I remember at least two. I, I'm not sure that all four. But they withdrew that law, though. <laughs> no, no, the, no. This is based on the Secretary of Agriculture's. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is very recent. I've, I've been to presentations recently on these. Um, so. So one would be it's exempt from regulatory if it's a deletion of any size. And deletions, and the reason you would be the del deletions happen naturally, and so it's, it's no different. It, it's no different than what could happen in nature. Um, it would be exempt if it only if the plant only includes genetics from its own gene pool. Again, with the reasoning that that would be that would also occur naturally. Um, one is a single base substitution, which I don't think I don't think I've, I don't think it's been fully explained why that would be exempt. Um, 
I'm not particularly worried about those, but but that's the <coughs> in the fourth some of what is occurring to me. But maybe I'll ask. I noticed your hand was up. So, uh, so this is a, a very different direction. Um, you talked about um, genetic engineering as facilitating rapid responses, um, and of course those would have their own consequences. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about time. Um, the, What's the timing involved here? Um, and I'm a social scientist, um, so I don't know the biochemistry, but it would be interesting to start thinking about time. And when we talk about sustainable, there's always this kind of implicit time dimension in the word sustainable. Right. Um, and then among your social considerations, you have great questions, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, you know, or maybe you want to add the question, at what pace would these innovations happen? Okay. At what pace would these innovations happen? Yeah, so it's, but that's about the biochemistry question, but it's yeah. all, there's also a social dimension to that. Yeah, 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 I'm thinking about the social dimension. Yeah, um, yeah it's a good question. Yeah, it's a good one. I don't think I've ever really been asked that one, so I, I might wing it here in just a second, but I want to go back. So uh, you, you also asked about... Uh, that you, you talked about um, genetic engineering as facilitating more rapid responses. Oh, yeah, sure. right. Yeah. And sustainability, right, mm -hmm. over the long term. So what I presented was, was my thinking on sort of stra strategies that will allow for sustainable um, use of genetics. And, and I, I'm referring to, I, I like your question uh, in the sense of how long is sustainable. I, I actually think of sustainability as an indefinite you know, dimension, not, not that there's a time limit on it. So, um, so I think of <clears throat> diversifying management approaches to diseases and diversifying the genetic solutions to genetic diseases as, an indefinite, as indefinite strategies. Um, I showed that list of options, you know, uh, gene rotation, um, t multiple targets on this, you know, against the same pathogen gene, et cetera. I talked about those to show that it was actually, these were feasible. Um, but I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't, especially with our exploding knowledge of genetics, even today, and it's only going to move faster, I, I don't see why we couldn't just keep going with different genes. Uh, you know, uh, there's just a wealth of genetic in information that can help us with genetic disease control. And, and furthermore, um, what commonly happens is there can be a fitness cost to a, the pest adapting to a particular resistance gene. So if that occurs, you can loop back in 20 years, maybe. You know, I'm just picking a number. But in some time, you can loop back and reuse that same gene. So I, I think there's a vast landscape of opportunities, some of which will not be practical, many of which might not be practical, but some will. So I think that what I've outlined, in my, in my opinion, is, is adequate strategy, a reasonable strategy, whether we do it through genetic engineering or not. Um, the, um, at what pace? Yeah, I, 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 I probably want to draw that. I'm going to come up with something to say on the way back. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll email you, because it's a good question. I like it. Yeah, I'll see you. Paul, we've got a question from the live stream. Okay. What was the paper that you mentioned about BT in Colombia? Oh, we can go back to that. So yeah, the BT, the paper of BT and Colombia. Let's make sure it's coming through. So I'm weaving the threads. The experience of female farmers with biotech and culture. Thank you. So you started by saying that um, you thought if these techniques were used wisely, they could contribute to the common good. Yes. I'm curious, given your experiences, what potential unwise uses are you most concerned about? Um, yeah, so the two that come to mind as a biologist would be, um, and, and there's probably some social dimensions too that, that we'll come up with, but um, one is the widespread use of a single gene for, for resistance to a disease or an insect pest. Um, I th for at least a time, the, the BT cotton was 
I am right out of one of the National Academy reports. I think it's yours, right? Um, really, yeah. Who read that, by the way, did a great job. Um, uh, so there was a single gene construct used in BT cotton throughout the world. So that we know that we know that's risky because then if something adapts to that trait, you know, you've got why or, or there's a pleiotropic effect of that that gene, you've got a widespread problem on your hands, or maybe around the world. On that crop, not on all crops, but on that crop. Um, we, how do we know that that's a risk? Because it's happened with conventional breeding. So it's not unique to genetic engineering, but I think that, you know, that, that goes back to that sustainability discussion. I think we really want for you know, long-term sustainability lots of genetic approaches um, over sprays, in my, in my humble opinion. Um, Okay, and the other, the other risk uh, would, biologically would be uh, transgene flux. So a transgene, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, is a gene that's from outside the breeding pool. Okay, so dogs are a breeding pool, right? So a cat gene would be a transgene. So, um, so I think transgenes, they, they, do, they do move in pollen. So, um, you know, that you can just imagine potential social issues, like what about organic growers, or biological issues, what about the neighboring species, the related species in the forest. So that creates, I think it creates uncertainty, the use of transgenes. It doesn't create necessarily risk, that is to say known harm, possible harm, but it creates uncertainty. We don't necessarily really fully know what the long-term effects of transgene uses are. We pay a lot of attention to transgene issues, you know, risks in, in, in ecological studies. It is, it is something that gets a lot of attention. But if, you know, if, 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 if somebody says to me, well, you know, I'm concerned about transgene flow because I'm, I'm concerned, you know, just concerned, I always say well, that's, a, that's a rational place to be. I think if we do that, you know, if we were to eliminate all transgene use, which is defensible, we were giving up something too, like that cassava. I didn't show the picture of the brown streak resistant cassava. I'm, you know, that's pretty important to those people that grow cassava. So, or, or I think could be important to them. So, there are lots of transgenes that probably, in my opinion, are worth using. But that's a point where we can, we, anybody could differ on. Yeah. E e economics is one of the major factors of getting the seeds, the penetration to get them. It looks like there's a lot of gene discovery going on, and if, if genes are discovered, even universities patent it, and then start a company, and then Monsanto gets it. Yeah. And so you don't come out of that. Is there any efforts to make it lower the barriers to access to the seeds? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. So is there any effort to lower the barriers to, to the use of these technologies by? Other th smaller institutions than, say, the Monsantos of the world. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, actually, so I mentioned the uh, APHIS discussions, USDA APHIS, to reduce um, or to identify certain uses of, of CRISPR based gene editing or gene editing um, that, are, that, are, that are exempt from regulation. You know, I'm not here to, to, to sort of argue for regulatory reform, because I believe that regulations are really important to protecting our, our world and our species. And in this particular case, I'm in, I, I, I named the th two applications that I think are, are, use, are good to, to consider as a society to make it more accessible, to make the, certain uses of gene editing more accessible to university researchers and um, you know, small companies and uh, you know, uh, foundations that might be funding ge genetically engineered traits that are useful to small holders. So I think actually regulatory reform, in this case, is, is a good thing to be discussing. I did see a hand here. So. Uh, just because you uh, invited comment on the democratizing ability of CRISPR mm -hmm. in plants, um, so my lab does 
we jumped on the CRISPR train a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it has not quite been our experience that CRISPR is universally applicable. So mm -hmm. it, it certainly it will work mm -hmm. on any piece of DNA. Um, mm -hmm. But it and it, it comes through conferences and the grapevine, this is true in other cases, you still have to fine tune it for every organism. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess my personal somewhat limited perspective from that experience is that if CRISPR has to be optimized in each new organism you use it in, it's not that much different from the situation now where you may have to have a specialized transformation or modification method for every organism. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks. So to summarize that for those that are listening, um, it, uh, your experience you've done, you've done this for, uh, your experience is that it has to be optimized for each organism that you do it in. And so that, uh, yeah, sort of presents a, maybe, a, maybe, maybe it's not any more democratic than um, transformation systems. Is that, did I summarize you correctly? To put it more succinctly, we didn't find it any easier. We didn't find it any easier. the old things <laughs> easier to do. Oh, <laughs> okay. Is that a delivery Thank issue? You. Is that a delivery issue or is that functioning uh, of crystal things? We, well, we're still untangling it. We still have this project. Um, I think in our case, we have an organism with a complex genome, which may be involved and makes it hard to screen. Um, and it may, there's some stuff coming out that the temperature of plants may reduce the activity of Cas9, so we try to even them up. Um, but not, none of that goes into the, the quips about being able to <laughs> genetically modify any organism anywhere. Um, so we have to go through it one by one. Okay. Yeah. Thank and thanks for that comment. Appreciate that. So I see well, two hands. Uh, on this, the issue of democratization, uh, the gentleman mentioned Monsanto. Monsanto was gone. Okay. <laughs> and now it's been purchased by Bayer Crop Science. And I would submit, and this is arguable, I'm sure, that they are gone because of strategic difficulties, both with the BT package group and with the glyphosate group, both of which are heavily compromised at this time in many countries. So. The value came out of their product line, and they're basically sold as a cash cow because of the Gakamba business, which is also problematic. So, the kinds of problems that we've always had with commercial pesticides, we're going to have with genes. The gentleman's question about where are, are the resistance management techniques of one applicable to the other? Yeah, you could draw an equation and just put in product and then means. They just sit together, they're the same thing, they run parallel. But there is a real opportunity for a democratization of the system because, you know, we and I have talked about this before. People say, Monsanto said, that their commercialization package cost about $300 million, of which that includes the cherry wood desk of Bob Fraley, I'm sure, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, been in this business. The regulatory package could be $100 million, could be that high, okay? But there are ways to work with it. And I invited a presentation from uh, Tom Wiedegard. Uh, we're going to send this to Nature Biotech. We're going to write the whole thing up. We believe we've registered a beneficial trait for about three quarters of a million dollars. Okay, that's the gossip of trait in cotton. This is doable. Okay, we are now at a log jam, though, in commercialization which is getting somebody to give us another trait because a grower won't buy, even though this is a highly beneficial trait, they won't buy it without a package, and quite frankly, we're commercially blocked. You're right. I said that. You're commercially, commercially blocked. blocked. Com commercially blocked. We can't get a partner to pick this up. We're commercially blocked. Okay? And we can't sell it ourselves as a conventional because we've investigated that. So, I mean, this is a very interesting story. We're kind of like golden rice. But we did register a trait, a very beneficial trait, for three quarters of a million dollars. So you're blocked because there's a trait? Uh, no, nobody will say, we, we cannot sell this trait because we cannot put it in a conventional variety. Nobody wants this trait. It's pro bono. The value, I mean, look at the value. I'm getting too, too long involved here, but the value stream of this largely falls to the grower, not the company that can't see how to make money from it. They won't give us access to trades. 
We're very like golden rice. This is going to be a great story in Nature Biotech. I don't, I don't know how far we're going to go with it because we're a commercial company. I write it up the way I just said it. And I said it here and we'll defend it. But we'll see if that gets in print. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was wondering about need to pull uh, to put up a, a, a product since you are analyzing replacement of a fung uh, of of uh, fungicide on a, bac a, a bacterial um, something to control bacteria. Do you think that the fact that antibacterials are restricted to human health or are being pushed to would would pull the the need of of um, Innovation? Would what? The need of? of innovation. I'm sorry, I think the question. I'm, I'm going to try to rephrase it. Yeah. So, uh, there, there, there is a, a, a higher, there could, there could be a higher need on, on something to control bacteria, bacterial diseases. There are, there are, all, all, there are alternatives, uh, chemical alternatives for fungicide, uh, as fungicides, right? Do you think that the fact that it, there's a wider need of a, of a bacteria site, of bacteria control, could pull advances on the field further than um, um, control? Um, yeah, let me, let me see if I, if, I, if I can answer your question. Um, so, uh, in plant disease control, most of the bacterial disease control is accomplished by coppers like we saw in the tomato, the tomato genome. So that, that's not in con conflict with human uses, you know, like, like antibiotics for medication and so on. Um, there are a couple uh, uses of antibiotics for plant disease control that are pretty, pretty limited and, um, and, you know, and maybe not, arguably not the wisest thing to do, but, um, but I, I get the feeling there was more to your question than that. I, I was just trying to, to see if how much of a need pulls the research, if it's something that drives research or not, the actual need. On, on well, the, mo the most, of, most of the need for disease, most of the application of disease control chemicals would still be fungicides. So that's where the big need is. I, I mentioned bactericides because we do, we do spray for, for uh, bacteria as well, and again, copper being did you want to comment? Yeah, the, the question earlier on about the pace of innovation yeah. and the pace of products that have come out, in the very first slide when you show herbicide use, you know, herbicide resistant crops, mm -hmm. the technology was moved really by industry and not by the science and the academia, basically, or by the need. Uh, and that question about bacteria is also very relevant because we have no controls for viruses or bacteria, really, except for copper. So there's really a need by growers to have alternatives, either CRISPR, Cas9, or even transgenic crop plants that will control those diseases. But it's been the drive by industry on these field crops that have BT resistance, insect resistance, or herbicide resistance, because they can sell more and make more money. Yeah. And the bottom line is the real need from the disease standpoint is for control of fungi and bacteria and viruses. And there's only one GM, GM crop plant out there, you know, the, the green papaya. spot, papaya. And it's because the industry is about to go under. So there's really a, a need for more either transgenic or CRISPR Cas9 gene edited disease control for plant pathogens. And yeah. it's just been totally ignored because the vectors were owned by Monsanto, which is not no longer, you know, just even having to pay companies to own the tech, parts of the technology. So CRISPR does democratize, I think, because, mm -hmm. you know, you can make your own guide RNA and go with it. It might be a little trouble getting the system going, but it brings it down to the level of last day. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, it would be great if the ecologists and the plant pathologists were thinking about where the need is and deploying the right uh, technology. And it's got to be for pathogens, I think. You know. What a great comment. Yeah, I focus on pesticides in this talk, but, but you're absolutely right. There's so, there's, there's so many needs out there. You know, viruses, what do we do you know, with viruses? Sometimes we don't have a good answer. So, yeah, Gene, Gene is an internationally recognized plant pathologist. You probably all know that, but yes. So one of your points was that if you stacked 
different strategies into one product, then that would make it more sustainable and last longer. Yeah, that's um, right, right, exactly. Right. And, that, and that's, I think we know that from published yeah. research. But why, how do we know that that's a better strategy than a sequential approach? Oh. So is it, is it the economics? Is it the risk management? What drives us to say it's better to put all the, all the things in one and resistance takes much longer time to develop versus deploy one product, let resistance emerge, then deploy the next, and basically have a series, and in, in your argument before, if you had a series of say three, four, or five strategies, you might even be able to cycle them, but if you put them all together in one cassette and resistance eventually emerges, then you've lost them all forever. Yeah. Well, you're not done. I mean, you would never stop accumulating new traits, but um, yeah. yeah, but actually, um, I've got, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rely <coughs> on my years of study of fungicide resistance, and we have gotten into these debates for decades, you know, what's better? It's like, no air light, less filling, or taste great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's better, rotation or, or, or alternation? And, and there, I think, you know, by and large, the data seem to favor uh, mixtures of fungicides and, mm -hmm. and, al and alternation of fungicides. But you know what? The difference is pretty minor in, in the grand scheme. So, so I think what matters is mixing it up constantly, constantly confront the pathogen with new <coughs> genetics. And, and you know, there's a limit to how fast they can get that. You know, so, so maybe there'll be some surprises along the way. I don't want to suggest they never are. But um, again, remember you know, those pictures of the aerial applicators. You know, I mean, they're using fungicides, and there aren't many. You take away fungicides and genetics, you're less, often, less with very, often left with very little for disease control. Yeah, um, when it comes to best practices for s sustainability, you, you mentioned possible need for incentives. Possible uh, need for incentives for, for those to be adopted. Um, and I was wondering if that just comes from economic theory and existing literature, or if you have um, personal experiences. No, it's yeah, it definitely the, the incentives comment I mean, it comes from personal experience. There, yeah. there are probably half this room probably really knows more about economic incentives than I do. But, but I, that's my experience as a, somebody who works with farmers. Yeah, so I mean, can you elaborate on, I mean, do most of them uh, prefer short-term benefits then? Well, to, to, you know, to, I mean, growers, again, my experience is they're, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to make, you know, they're trying to control weeds next, this coming season, next season. Um, they want to do, generally, most of them, maybe all of them, want to leave the farm in good shape for their, their heirs. Um, so, you know, they try to do the right thing, but they are, you know, it's like imagine, <coughs> You know, imagine me, my salary, and I lose my salary, you know, 80% of my salary for a year, suddenly, because of an, of an epidemic. I mean, they, they, they live in a gutsy world, so yes, they do think short term, maybe more than we would. Big regulation. Uh, in U.S. it's better, but in EU, they just recently, they banned the uh, crispr case not added the plant as GMO. Yes. They cannot grow crispr case not added the plant in EU or import to EU. Right. So as a scientist, you know, sometimes this kind of decision are made by a very small group of people yeah. in the government. But as a scientist, no matter in academia or industry, how you can change this situation? Because good stuff is here, but we just cannot use it. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a good point. So sometimes um, using Europe as an example of decisions may be made by very small groups of people in government that may not uh, reflect uh, what scientists think. That I okay. So uh, yeah, I think that's true. You know, a lot of times I do outreach on genetic engineering with the public, and a lot of times they say, "Yeah, but what about Europe? They don't, you, you know, they don't use GMOs in Europe." And they're always surprised to hear that. European scientific organizations are no different from ours. The, you'll read some of the same things in the National Academy of Sciences report as you will in the European Union's, essentially the, the equivalent of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so, so I always tell people, uh, you know, I'm not really addressing your question, but but I, I always tell people that, you know, uh, we we don't want to force these. Th I don't want to force these things on people. If the Europeans don't want it. They don't want it, but that's the public, not their scientists. So their scientists see genetic engineering very similarly to the way we do. And they do some very good genetic engineering work, actually, a lot of good papers. Um, 
Yeah, and as to really more directly answer your question, I, I, I don't know what we do as scientists to, um, to address the issue. I think we, we, for those of us who have the time and the inclination, um, getting out with the public and talking about the technology is, can be a wonderful experience. You must do it in a way that is consistent with social science guidelines. I put up a, a publication on the website that you know, the GES website, that gives the guidelines I've learned from the social scientists. It's not the way, it's not the same as talking to a scientific audience. It's quite different, very different. And I can talk about that if anybody wants to talk about it. But, um, but, it, but it actually can be very gratifying to talk to the public about this controversial topic if you do it right. And, um, and, and that, that's as far as it goes. That's what we, people want to hear from scientists. Ultimately, maybe in 20 or 50 years, people are going to scratch their head and say, you mean they were opposed to these technologies? <laughs> I don't know. But, but I do know that the big public is interested in hearing from real scientists who honestly represent what, what the scientific community says and does. And with that, I will close today's book. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. We're always uh, really appreciative that we're from outside the university. So we'll see you all next week.